was the establishment of container and container orchestration standards. Kubernetes and container had the difference between underlying infrastructure and provide excellent possibility to support multi-cloud and hybrid cloud. Today, we invite Jeffrey Harmon, Vice President, Principal Analyst of Forrester, and Li Yi, Director of Alibaba Cloud Container Service to discuss their insights and new thoughts on container technology. Well, first off, I think it's fair to say that we're seeing a shift toward enterprise container platforms, which we would define as a software stack or set of managed cloud services that provide container-based software development environments, container orchestration, and management capabilities for development teams and for operations. Uh, enterprise container platforms allow teams to build, run, and manage container-based applications and infrastructure. What we find is that right now, these enterprise container platforms come in two major flavors. Um, some have a center of gravity on-premise. They're really designed to be operated by existing infrastructure and operations teams for an enterprise, and then extended into the cloud with consistent tools and platform services. These platforms have their center of gravity in the data center. The second major flavor starts in the public cloud, but adds capabilities that allow them to go on-prem and manage clusters from the public cloud. Now I'd call both of these approaches hybrid uh, cloud solutions, but there are some important differences. So first of all, you need to ask, where is your center of gravity gonna be from a development and management perspective? And how is it gonna change over the long term? And then wherever you think your long-term cloud strategy is going to be, uh, you need to align with a, a, an enterprise container platform that supports that strategy. Now, the second difference comes with respect to the level of abstraction. How much of the lower levels of container infrastructure do you want to manage and manipulate? Some organizations want a high degree of control. Other organizations are interested in speed and standardization. How much of the container platform do you want your developers to need to know in order to be productive with it? Now, when you have your center of gravity in the public cloud, I think it's easier to raise the level of abstraction for developers because you can implement managed services that streamline your container management. Container auto scaling is a good example or a managed service that gives you a private registry or a managed service that gives you DevOps pipelines. When the center of gravity for your enterprise container platform is on-prem, you're probably going to take on more of the management workload yourself. And so it's going to take a little bit more time to stand it up, and it's going to be more complex. Now, these major train, trends set up a longer, more important trend, in my opinion. I think that the current level of, of abstraction for most Kubernetes products uh, orchestrating containers is really still too low for the average enterprise developer. There's too much that they have to know about infrastructure, uh, control and data planes, networking configurations, uh, CRDs, and, and all that YAML. In some ways, it kind of reminds me of the glory days of enterprise Java beans when there was an awful lot of power in the early app servers, but there was so much complexity. I'll never forget uh, cracking open a 600 page IBM Red Book to get my first instance of web here up and running. And then the spring framework came along and it used something called an inversion of control pattern. And it made life just so much easier for Java developers. That's what I think is gonna happen in the enterprise container platform space. Platforms and services that reduce the cognitive load on developers by automating and abstracting issues like security, identity management, integration, and scaling will help enterprise developers because it'll let them focus on writing code that drives business value instead of spending all their time mucking around with the plumbing. Now, that's one of the reasons that I think that there's a really bright future for function as a service runtimes deployed on container platforms. Taking scaling of services up and down off the developer's plate is a significant reduction in cognitive overload. Streamlining deployment of services also helps. The traditional issues with FAS services have been that you have to leave behind your existing code and frameworks and using containers increase the types of workloads that developers can deploy and makes it easier to adopt existing frameworks and libraries like web frameworks as an example. So matching FAS services to container platforms does both. It reduces the cognitive over overload, uh, but it also allows developers to use what they already know. 
It's one reason that when I just finished my current wave on fast services, I took a very close look at the level of container support that they have. Now, beyond that, I think the ability to mix microservices and containers with other serverless offerings in the public cloud will also help further abstract developers from the complexity of Kubernetes. A service mesh is one potential approach to this. Uh, using event grids uh, is another. What about you, Lee? Okay, th thanks for, for your answers. And, and one more thing I want to mention is about service container. We all know about Kubernetes is fantastic, but, but it's very hard to operate. And the user need to manage the worker node and be responsibility for the uh, daily operation, like applying the security fix, do some capacity planning, et cetera. And, you know, to solve such kind of challenges, how about cloud provide some innovation product, so-called serverless Kubernetes, ASK. There has some key benefits. First is about strong isolation. So every pod running on a micro VM, they have very strong security boundary for the isolation. And secondly, it's highly compatible. It passed most of the CNCF Kubernetes component testing. And it fully supports the CSI storage, like the block storage, network store, network file system, et cetera. And also support the, the ingress, the service load balancers, the mesh, and, and more. It supports GPU instance, so you can easily build your AI platform in the serverless way. And it's extremely elastic. It can start part in 10 seconds. For example, uh, with Weibo, you know, it's one of the largest social media in China. It leverages ASK for the whole news recommendation. It can scale 1,000 parts less than one minute. It will saving 70 percentage time of scaling. Okay, in the last year, the year over year goes of the serverless container usage is nine times. So I believe that will be more and more customers try for the elastic workload. Uh, Jeffrey, in your experience, what is the major monument for container adoption by enterprise customers? And do you observe any difference between global and Chinese customers? Yeah, uh, it's interesting, uh, we do. Uh, in 2020, uh, when we asked uh, global customers whether or not uh, they plan to use a container service, uh, container as a service, in a public cloud, uh, we saw that overall uh, about 19% said that they had implemented uh, and uh, had no plans to expand. 15% said that they were implemented and currently expanding. 22% uh, said that they were implementing, 21% said they were planning to implement in the next 12 months. Uh, only uh, about 14% said that they had no immediate plans to implement and 9% said that they were not implemented. So that's the global data. Now for our Chinese respondents, we saw that only 2%, so one out of 50 said that they were not interested in using a container as a service. It's a pretty big difference. We also saw that in general, the responses ticked a few percentage points ahead uh, for Chinese respondents. 23% said that they had already implemented, weren't uh, planning to expand anymore versus the 19%. We saw that 24% uh, said that they were planning to implement in the next 12 months versus the 21%. Uh, so I would say that there are that, that that when it comes to containers as a service offerings, the the Chinese market's a little bit in advance of the global market. Now, if we look at those that are going to be using containers within a Kubernetes orchestrated platform, I think those differences are even a little bit more pronounced. So as an example, 11% of respondents globally said they're not interested in using Kubernetes uh, um, within a public cloud and, and, and deploying containers that way. But again, in our, in our Chinese respondents said only 2% uh, said that they weren't interested. 26% of Chinese respondents said that they were already implementing uh, Kubernetes uh, and, and using it to manage containers versus 21% of the global number. 24% uh, said that they were planning to implement in the next uh, 12 months versus 20% uh, in the global numbers. So in general, I would say that the Chinese market is a little bit ahead of the rest of the world with respect to its use of containers in general in the public cloud and Kubernetes specifically. Okay, and how about you? Okay, thanks. Thanks. You know, that's amazing. 
Kubernetes is becoming the new operating system for the cloud. And in China, the internet company are early adopter for the cloud native technologies. And uh, you know, most of them chose Kubernetes to deploy their workload on cloud. And most of the enterprise customer just uh, journey for, for that. And one of the challenges is lack of the skill. And Alibaba Cloud team will help them to cross in the chasm. Okay, thank you. We know that cloud is keeping evolving. And what is your opinion for distributed cloud or distributed infrastructure? And what is our thought for cloud native big data and AI, Jeffrey? Well, I'll tell you the main thing that I'm watching right now is the growth of edge cloud capabilities. We're seeing compute and, and not just compute, but also storage moving out toward the edge of the cloud. And it's happening in interesting ways. Uh, there's the evolution of traditional content distribution networks, CDNs, that make them able to handle more dynamic content. Uh, edge functions are a fast evolving technology there. And then there are efforts to take container orders all the way to the edge, either with Kubernetes or as a standard packaging format. Uh, containers at the edge make a lot of sense when you have infrastructure to place them in. Um, IoT examples, manufacturing examples, telecommunications providers are all well suited to take advantage of container technology. And once you get containers close to the edge, it's not too long before you need storage there too. It can be as simple as key value pair storage, or it can be more complex constructs like document storage or graph databases. And when you put storage and compute close to the edge of a distributed cloud, it enables workloads like personalization, active security, faster execution of AI models, and geo-optimized workloads. We're also seeing a new generation of front-end web frameworks that can take advantage of, of that edge compute. Uh, one example is all the heat and light around the Jamstack approach to building web applications. Now, if you wanna look at the specific impact that this has on big data and AI, I think it comes back to, uh, to the OODA loop. If you're not familiar with it, it stands for observe, orient, decide, act. Now, what developers need to ask is, where does it make sense for each of these activities to take place? Do I want to observe what's going on as close as possible to the customer? Uh, do I have all the information that I need there to make a decision? Or do I need to take that information back to uh, the core of the network where I have better compute resources to figure out what I need to do? Do I need to pull together information from many different locations? If so, I'm probably going to come back to the core of the cloud. And what are the costs in terms of the resources as I match them up to each stage of, of, of that process of making a decision and taking an action. Um, as we move forward, I think that developers will be looking at these things and building systems that essentially make best use of both edge and core cloud resources. Thank you. And do you have any other comments, Lee? Okay, th that's cool. And, and Alibaba Cloud just announced the local region. It follows the same architecture of the central region of Alibaba Cloud but it deployed closer to customer. That would be great helpful for enterprise to exploit the cloud benefit, but also meet the requirement for security compliance or support workloads required low latency, high bandwidth, local network access. And uh, ACK fully support local region. With that, you can deploy a Kubernetes workload in the distributed cloud environment without any code change. Mm, and for the AI and big data part, we observed the trend of more and more customer start to deploy the big data and AI application on Kubernetes. And ACK provides a set of essential features to improve the resource utilization and accelerate AI workload and simplify the uh, machine learning ops. For example, with the GPU sharing, the GPU utilization will be increased 100%. With the distributed data cache, the air training speed will improve 20%. And, uh, you know, ACK support running Spark, Presto, Flink, et cetera, in Kubernetes cluster natively with enhanced scalability, elasticity, and job scheduling. Furthermore, Many Alibaba Cloud big data and AI services like data lake analytics, EMR Spark, real-time compute, and DataWorks 
they are all built on top of ACK. And uh, you know, we'd like to help customer for the digital innovation with the cloud native technologies. Thank you. Thank you for having this excellent talk today. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Lee. Thank you very much. For